morning. So good to see everybody today. Glad that you are all with us today. We're going to be turning to Hebrews. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, to take our reading and our lessons from there primarily from the end of the reading. We're going to start in verse 18. We're going to read down to verse 29. It's a bit of a long reading to start, but it won't be one we'll look at all in detail. What we'll find is that this is the concluding paragraph to the main line of argument in the Hebrew letter. Hebrews 13 contains some exhortations and uh, short, uh, short points, uh, mainly on Christian ethics and a little bit on some encouragement. But the main line of the argument through the book of Hebrews, how Christ is better in so many different regards, and that we should remain totally faithful to him and especially not go back to the Old Testament system, uh, that is wrapped up and concluded in this paragraph. In Hebrews Uh, tells us in the 13th chapter, it's a word of exhortation, which I believe is another way to describe a sermon. I think Hebrews is basically the full text of a sermon. And what we have here in Hebrews 12 is the last of the sermon, basically the part that leads to the invitation. And so we have the conclusion and the uh, uh, call to action from the book of Hebrews in this section of which we'll read. Let's begin reading in verse 18. For you have not come to a mountain that cannot be touched, and to a blazing fire, and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind, and the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a better and new covenant, and to sprinkle blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of the things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And so I think you can tell definitely by that why I chose this to be the text which we talk about the year 2020 and use it as a Thanksgiving sermon. No, that's what we're going to do. It really is. What we note is this, well, first we would note the constant references and summation of the things that are laid out for us in the book of Hebrews. But what we'll note here is, really for our purposes, the breaking down of things into two categories. The category of shakeable and the category of unshakable. The things which uh, are, are now removed, but which when given were frightening, and the people said, we don't want any more, as opposed to the reaction of those under the new covenant, who have these things all glorious and bright, not fire and gloom and darkness and whirlwind and and, and scary words, but we have the things that are glorious and bright, the living and enduring kingdom of God. And how many of us, if we were heard, hey, there's going to be a bit more revelation from God about this matter, how many of us would say, sign us up right now? Now, I know that there won't be any more revelation. I, I realize that the desire possibly for more has been used as a tool by the devil to give people things like the Book of Mormon and the like, which purport to be more, but no, there's no more. 
But uh, the nature of the revelation that we've been given and the nature of the blessings in the new covenant which have been shared, who wouldn't want a double helping? But the day they got the law of Moses, they didn't want any more at all. They wanted to go hide in their tents while Moses went up to the mountain. He went to that gloomy and fearful and distressing place in the presence of God, and he was going to bring down the word for them. So... We have have come to a different kind of covenant. We have come to a different kind of world in Christ and the world that's in Moses. But what we do note here is there is, in this text, a number of things which are shakable. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but the heaven. We live, and it has been truly demonstrated to us this year, that we live in a shakable world. Now, when Moses received the law, God spoke, and in his presence and voice, the earth shook. Exodus 19, just before the Ten Commandments, these things of which uh, the Hebrew writer was speaking and summarizing. It says this, Moses took the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, And the whole mountain quaked violently. And then when the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered back with thunder. When God acts, when God is present, when God reveals himself, it's noticeable. And to those who aren't with God, and sometimes even to those some who are with God, it can be disconcerting when the day of the lord comes what kind of day will it be and we can think about just how our little world can be so shaken by personal tragedy or loss or disappointment or bereavement or or some other kind of normal thing of life just imagine if it becomes like a day of the lord book of amos in particular we won't read it but in amos he warns <coughs> warns the people Why do you keep asking for the day of the Lord? You people think that's all going to be glorious and bright, but it's going to be disaster, and it's going to be whirlwind, and it's going to be fire. But we call these things the day of the Lord for a reason, because they are his action. They are his uh, very direct action in a world that doesn't see him or acknowledge him until a disaster comes. When times are good, how many people remember to thank God? But when it's time to head to the foxhole or hide in the cave, who do they remember then? Uh, Yeah, because it's his day, and and we're reminded of it. We have about 25 day of the Lord passages in the scripture. Let's just take one. We'll take uh, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 30, we'll read a short bit, bit there. Ezekiel 30, verse 3. For the day is near. Even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for nations. And sword will come upon Egypt, and anguish will be in Ethiopia. When the slain fall in Egypt, and they take away her wealth, and her foundations are torn down, Ethiopia, Put, Lud, all of Arabia, Libya, and the people of the land that is in league will fall with them that is by the sword. And so the Lord from time to time has a day of the Lord. He has a day of shaking. He has a day of reset. He has a day where he clears the field of that which is wrong and in error and oppressive so that that which is right may grow. And so there is a cleaning off of the field. The brush hog of justice goes through and knocks it all down. And so we have a shakable world because we have a shaker. And we notice in this passage, it's, it was Egypt at the center and with them, uh, uh, pardon me, Ethiopia, so that would be the upper stretches of the Nile. But then the lands below that, uh, Put and Lud, and Arabia to the east, and Libya to the west. What we find was that when God started shaking, when God came in a day of, of the Lord, it was often, at least in this passage, it was regional. And it's not just regional, sometimes it's worldwide. And so that's why this year has been for us I think worldwide, uh, it's been a a disconcerting year because we've been given a bit of a shake. 
We've been reminded world over that we are in a shakable world and so many things that we thought were immutable, so many things we thought that were permanent structures, so many things that we thought were institutions that could survive anything. There were things too big to fail. Turns out they weren't. And so there's been stressing and testing all over at government levels, business levels, and just look at people's investments. Look at what it's done to our schools, our communities. Look what it's done to congregations. Uh, look what it's done to every kind of thing where uh, people get together in every kind of thing, whether uh, relationships one with another or even just individually. Everything and everyone has been shaken to some degree. Now, some a lot more than others. Some things have, have been shaken in tears that they're about ready to totter over and fall. Other things seem uh, to be uh, pretty resilient thus far. But I have to say that everything has been tested. And so we have needed to learn a new set of skills this year. And I don't just mean Zoom. <laughs> I mean, but, you know, putting on our best brave face and saying, I know this, this is bad, but uh, we'll get through it somehow. Uh, and we're telling people uh, more and more to uh, trust and have faith. I, I hear more about trust now from all kinds of, of uh experts in the world than I used to hear even from preachers and trust and faith. That used to be our bailiwick, didn't it? Yeah, it still is. We have something better to trust in. But what we find is when the world starts to shake, faith is one of the few things that we can cling to. Of course, it's not just the only thing. We also have faith with that hope and love, don't we? We have the three Christian biggies, faith, hope, and love. Those are unshakable things. So what we find in this passage was there's a shakable thing. And in this passage in particular was a shakable world. Now, as I say, this is just a little shake. Because when God shakes the whole thing out, what happens to the earth and the heavens? It goes too. And so in a shake which will take out even the earth and the heaven, what can remain? Well, only the unshakable remains, which is his kingdom. Verse 22, we've come to that which can't be shaken. We have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the myriad of angels, and to the general assembly and church of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to sprinkle blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. Now let me ask you, what will shake that? <laughs> Try and shake that. The gates of hell won't prevail against it. And these things remain even when the earth does not. And so if these things can remain even when the earth and heaven no longer remain, what chance does 2020 have to shake them down? Well, none whatsoever. Absolutely none whatsoever. When he says, verse 27, yet once more, he denotes the removing of things that cannot be shaken. Well, these are the things which cannot be shaken. He says, so that that which cannot be shaken may remain. And so what we find is these things are fully under his protection. The spiritual things, the things brought in Christ, the things in the kingdom of God, however we wish to delineate them, and that was a pretty good list, that the Hebrew writer just came of breaking these things down into various segments. All of these things are under his protection. And so when a day of the Lord comes, what do you think happens to the house of the Lord? Well, it probably does pretty well, right? It probably does pretty well. well let me ask you, if, if the Americans, for instance, if the Americans invade a country, where's the safest place to possibly be? Usually it's the American embassy. If the Russians invade a country, where's the safest place to be? The Russian embassy, right? Whenever a country would invade another nation, what's one place they are not going to go wreck, ransack, and ruin? Their own house, their own place in it, right? And so when God shakes the world, where's the best place to be? In his house, in his house. Sometimes people marvel at this from the Beatitudes 
the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, blessed are the gentle, or the old translations say, blessed are the meek. So blessed are the meek, blessed are the gentle, for they will what? Inherit the earth. How did those people end up with the earth? They're meek, they're gentle, they're not out there fighting and clawing and grabbing more of it. They're not out there striving to uh, own as much of it as possible or to rule and reign over sections of it by hook or by crook. How is it that these meek and gentle get anything? Well, because when there's things in the way of God wanting to have what's their due, what does he do? He removes it. God shakes these other things out of the way so that the meek and the gentle can have it. God is in charge of it, and he sets the rules. And that, that's true whichever realm we want to talk about. If we're in the church, why do we listen to the word of God? Well, because it's his house. He sets the rules. But the whole world is what? The whole world is ultimately his. And when things get too far out of whack, what does he do? He shakes it back down and puts it to a reset so it will come back in a way that he likes. And that's what those prophecies, if we recall, when we read from Hebrews 12 a while ago, in Hebrews 12, 26, it says, now it was promised that he said, well, let's go back and read the promise of what he said now, and that's in the book of Haggai. Now, normally, when we're having uh, day, uh, sermons that will be about Thanksgiving, we go to Haggai, right? Yeah, we do. No, we don't usually go to Haggai. Now, Haggai is one of those little books toward the back of the Old Testament. Haggai writes to the people as they are in restoration period after the captivity. Uh, Haggai writes as they are putting up the second temple. At that time, it had been in foundations for a long time and not much progress was being made. And so uh, there was an instruction given by the prophets of God to build this house. And don't worry, I'm with this house, it will go well, is the overall message from Haggai. But notice how that message comes. Haggai 2.5. It says, as for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt. <laughs> Don't you like it when God refers back to a promise made a thousand years before? I mean, all of this seems like old hat to us and old, old history to us. But even when Haggai was around, this was a thousand years ago. Now, I'm sorry, round number, only 750. In any case, he goes back to cent a centuries-old promise made when they came out of Egypt, and he says, My spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and also the dry land. I will shake all the nations and they will come with the wealth of all the nations. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace. When they're rebuilding this temple, which to them at the time seemed like a small thing. Remember, the old folks wept when they saw the temple because it was so small compared to the <coughs> glorious thing that they had seen right before its fall that Solomon had built. Well, God says, don't worry. This house will have greater glory than the, than the temple of Solomon. And today we, we look back and when we think about the temple in Jerusalem, we think about this temple. We don't think about Solomon's because this temple stood for a very long time and the Lord spoke in it and the apostles preached the gospel in it. And it was a glorious place and we still dream of it, though it is long ago. But God says, I'm going to shake heaven and I'm going to shake the earth and I'm going to make this place great. See, that wasn't even a promise of the end of all things, which is how the Hebrew writer applies this passage and uses it now from a Christian perspective, saying th that God's one day going to do that. And so if you think about that temple as it was in its little foundations and how it blossomed under God's care, I think we can think about the church today and when God does things, how it will blossom under his care and how it will eventually be. But God says, I'm, I'm looking out for this place. You guys are just here at step one or two. You guys are here in the baby step form of this. This is going to turn out well. And I will move heaven and earth to do it. And then again, a couple of verses later, here's the message to go speak to the governor. Speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow <coughs> the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of kingdoms and of nations. I will overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders will go down, every one by the sword of another, 
On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shittail, my servant, declares the Lord. I will make you like a signet ring, for I've chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. And so, Lord, we're building this temple surrounded by kingdoms with big armies. Lord, we're building this temple surrounded by enemies on all sides. And he said, don't worry. <laughs> They're going to be nothing. Horse and rider, not a problem. Remember the first song of Israel, uh, the song of Moses? Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. Egypt and all their chariots, what did they do when God shook the world? And so now these that surround them, what are these horses and riders and their chariots going to do when God shakes the world? And today, what are they going to do with their fighter jets and their nuclear-tipped missiles? And what are they going to do with their nuclear-powered aircraft carriers? And what are they going to do with their tanks and their smart bombs and their satellite-guided things? What's all that going to be when God says, I don't want it, it's, I'm tired of it, Pff, fall over? What's going to happen? It's going to fall. I think in our lifetime, we've seen such a thing. Uh, we saw the fall of the Soviet Union without hardly a shot fired. And I think if we live long enough, we might see more of that kind of thing. And we don't know in which nation or how or when, but do we trust that there was somebody behind it doing it? Why do these things fall so quickly? Well, because their foundations were poor and they got shook a little. And what happens if the foundations are poor and it gets to be a bit of shaking? There's not much left. But where do we live? Under his protection in the world beyond the shaking. This is where we live and this is where our hope is. We have come again, verse 22, to Mount Zion. We've got the city of the living God. We, we are in the heavenly Jerusalem. We're with the myriads of angels. We're in the general assembly in church of the firstborn who are rolled in heaven. That didn't fit on the sign, so we just put church of Christ. But, but that's our church, isn't it? The general assembly in church of the firstborn. We're with God who judges all. We're with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And one day we hope to join them as having been perfected in Jesus Christ, who's the mediator of the new covenant. And by his sprinkled blood, we have all these things. We have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And so this is where we go from the 2020 sermon to the Thanksgiving sermon. Look at verse 28. Verse 28, therefore... Since we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude. Thursday is our annual day where, by tradition, custom, presidential proclamation, we have our annual day of gratitude. I hope we have gratitude a lot more than that. Also, I hope we have turkey and dressing a lot more than that. But I hope we really have gratitude much more than that. Since we receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. And so, folks, we have a kingdom that will endure. We have a kingdom of inestimable value, but also of interminable length. It, it doesn't have a terminus. It doesn't have an end. We know when it began uh, but there is no end. It just it, it goes into eternity. And so what we do in this kingdom can be remembered. What we do in this kingdom can be forever remembered. I recall when I was growing up at school, around our school campus, there were various plaques and memorials. And at uh, orientation for freshmen, they took us around. And they, uh, they showed us some of these things. And we had one particular m little memorial uh, it was a little lion, about 18 inches high, uh, of kind of a lion cub. It was a very nice little statue. And it was dedicated to three students who all died in the same year. And uh, they had to go around and teach us and tell us what that meant and why we had that there. Because otherwise nobody would have known. Enough years had passed that nobody knew the students involved. And then I also remember when I went to university, because I also get to give this speech, uh, there was a, a, a fair part of freshman orientation was to go around campus and show people various memorials and various things. And one of the things, there was a, a professor who the, the residence hall had been, was named after, and I worked in that residence hall. And so when people came by the freshman orientation tour, I got to give them the speech about the guy, our guy, the guy our hall was named after, and show the picture of 
Dr. Gunther up on the wall and tell about him and what he did because otherwise nobody would know. Well, as it turns out, schools have to limit how many such memorials uh, they can put up because over the years, how many students die who are associated with schools? And especially with universities where there's lifelong contacts with some people and, and some of the staff and some of the beloved professors, if we turned everything into a memorial for notable ones of them, well, pretty soon we'd, just, we'd have a mausoleum and not an educational institution, right? And so there has to be a limit as to how many things can be remembered and how many things can be put on campus and various things like that. And then as we go around and tell people about these, what do you think the incoming freshman class think about any of it? Yeah, they don't, they don't care. They really don't. And so it's really, you know, it's, it's nice that there's a tribute. It's nice, I guess, that these things are remembered at all. But what's the enduring value of these things done in these institutions? And educational institutions are some of the longer-lasting institutions we'll have in our society. But what, what's the real value after a century or two or three? So it becomes, it really, it really uh, becomes meaningless. We have this. This is from uh, a fellow named Studd, C.T. Studd. He was a missionary. He wrote a poem called Only One Life. His closing stanzas are this. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I know I'll say twas worth it all. Only one life, twill soon be passed. Only what's done in Christ will last. And so Stud, the missionary, said, anything I do that's not in Christ is temporary. And that's true. But when we do it in Christ, it will last because why? It's in an eternal kingdom. Is there time and place? Is there enough space? Is there enough uh, mind to have a proper memorial and a proper memory of all the things that are rightly and fitfully and faithfully done in Christ. Is there room in the kingdom for all good things in Christ to be remembered and properly uh, recompensed? Yes, because we have the time. It's an eternal kingdom. And we have one who has a knowledge of these things, who has a knowledge of everything, whose knowledge is infinite. And we have one who can properly reward each and every individual person. Right? And so again, think about that which is done in the kingdom and how it can have a really, an eternally enduring value. There's time, there's place, there's memory for all of these things in the mind of God. And don't we believe that about the mind of God? Otherwise, what are we going to be judged on the judgment for? Well, the things we've done in the body. Now, are there some of those Christians who lived a thousand years before us, who God is going to say, hold on, I'm having a little fuzzy memory problem. Who are you again? Because, you know, there's been a millennia of Christians after you. I'm kind of losing, losing memory of some of the old ones. No. What is God's recollection of the Christians of the first days? Full, perfect, and complete. And what is God's memory and recollection of, of the Christians uh, of, of the second century? Full and complete. And what about the third? And the fourth. We could do this exercise all the way to get up to the, the, the Christians who are now in the 20th century of this endeavor. And what is God's knowledge of them? Well, full, perfect, and complete. And so, because it's an eternal kingdom, and in many ways when it comes to God's knowledge of things and capacity to reward, it's an infinite kingdom... There's space for everybody, and everybody will be rightly and properly rewarded if they have their faith in Christ. And so 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, Paul concluding the sermon uh, in the chapter on the resurrection, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. And so since it's an unshakable kingdom, it's a place where we can give service that will always be recompensed and valuable. And how do we do that? 
it says, let us do that with gratitude, and reverence, and awe. Offer to God acceptable service with reverence and awe. Let us show gratitude. And so, we have been put into this great eternal kingdom. The first response should be gratitude. Aren't we glad we're here? Aren't we glad we're here? We should be very glad we're here. You know, when it comes to these kind of physical blessings, excuse me, these spiritual blessings, also does come with physical provision, but when it comes to these kind of blessings... Basically, we are, we, we are like lottery winners every day, aren't we? I mean, it, and I don't mean we won the daily lottery, the small prize. I mean, like every day we won the big prize. Every day we won the mega millions. Every day we got the big bucks in a spiritual capacity. Can you believe that we have, as a Hebrew writer here affirms, can you believe that we have access to Mount Zion? the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Can you believe we have access to that? We have access to that promised. You know, I, I see sometimes in this world, there's people who have these access cards, they have the pass to get into places. I never get a pass to go nowhere. You know, I get to go home or the sidewalk. That's pretty much my options. But we've got the all-access spiritual pass. Aren't you going to, I'm kind of glad they're not going to check IDs and, and look at mine and ask me to leave. But they're going to check the ID and go, oh yeah, he's, he's here. He's one of these. He's one of his. He's one of Jesus's. He's with him. He's in. And you're in this group. You're with myriads of angels. And you're with the general assembly and church of the firstborn enrolled in heaven. How did I get in that group? Oh, by God's grace. That's how you got in that group. That you had faith in Christ, and he said people with faith in Christ get to join that group, and you're in that group. And you get to go to go before God, the judge of all. And I think, oh boy, they're on to me, they're going to call me before the judge. How many of us are glad to be called before the judge? Except in this case, the judge is inviting you because the judge himself has perfected you. As it says in the next phrase, the spirits of the just or the spirits of the righteous made perfect. He made them just. He made them righteous through the blood of the Lamb, through Jesus, and He made them where they can come to Him. Normally, and if we don't have our hearts cleansed by faith, what is the thought of the approach of God? We're no better off than Israel when they quaked and quivered because God was speaking. But once their hearts knew Him by faith and were cleansed in Jesus Christ, what can happen when God approaches? We can go to him because we have Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant and the sprinkled blood. And so this is the part which should be the daily Thanksgiving sermon. All of these things we have access to. All of these things we have been given. As we sang in that song just before the Lord's Supper, thanks to God for such a Savior, now uh, enthroned in heaven above, thanks for his exalted favor. Blessed memorial of his love. Thanks to God for such a savior. Thanks for his exalted favor. This is what we've received. And so we've received this and it cannot be taken away. It cannot be shaken. And this is not that gloomy religion like in the law of Moses. Where there was a shaky mountain and a warning and, and a bunch of barriers saying don't cross and don't look and don't stare. But it's an access to see God face to face eventually and ultimately in the bright, gleaming city of heaven. And so this is where gratitude and reverence and awe ought to totally take over. This is what he's given us, and it can't be taken away. This is what he's given us, and it's not dependent upon any situation and circumstance in the world. Those get shaken repeatedly as time goes, and eventually they'll be shaken in such a way that they end entirely, and where are we going to be? In the presence of God, with the myriad of angels, and all the righteous men who've been made perfect, with that whole assembly and church of the firstborn, because they've been enrolled in heaven. If your name's in the book of life, these things are all given for you. And so I think about 
one final verse. And this should be our attitude going forward. It's an occasion where Jesus healed a lady in the synagogue. She'd been bent over for years, and he raised her up, and he gave her her health. And the, the Pharisees, they were not happy about that because they didn't want to magnify Jesus. And they complained about how he was healing on the Sabbath on the wrong day. And Jesus, by his helpfulness and his cheerfulness and the demonstration of power by the word of God, it says he humiliated his opponents. <clears throat> Luke 13, 17. And all his opponents were humiliated. And now the second part of the verse is the place where I want to live, where I want to be, where I want to stay. And the entire crowd was rejoicing over the glorious things being done by him. And that was one particular uh, healing, especially merciful and good. But again, just one healing, and they were rejoicing what he was doing. But we're not rejoicing over one healing. We are rejoicing at the glorious things he's done by giving us Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, by inviting us to join the myriad of angels, by enrolling us in the church and general assembly of the firstborn, by bringing us uh, to God in a way that we can stand and we can be glad to be in his presence rather than be ashamed of our sin, where we can be with the spirits of the righteous made perfect because of the new covenant and the sprinkled blood of Jesus. And so here, Hebrews 12, it has for us all the things of this year we've had, a shakable world and darkness and gloom, but also the most glorious things possible, which can never be taken away because they are truly unshakable. And so let us, with reverence, awe, and gratitude, offer to God, as it says in this verse, acceptable service. The only rational thing to do is to live the life of faith, which is the life of service, which is the life as directed by God. Because all of these things are by his order and his ordination, by the rules that he set. And luckily, he's made the rules relatively simple. It's all based on our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so today, if you need to come and name Christ, if you need to come confess him, and you need to be baptized to be added to his body, if you need to be baptized, uh, repenting of sins, if you need to join him and be identified with him, and if you need to express that faith in the way that he directed, or if you need to express your sin and regret for that and come back and repent, the invitation will be offered as we stand and say.